John Marco Cerezi. So we say oh, we were talking about Maria Bamford. Yes, I want to see her. There's a fucked up part. I think both her parents recently passed away. I think I believe I remember hearing that. I think she did. I thought she did an hour on that. Oh no, she she, she did a chord in about her mom, uh-huh. and then a couple months later, I think her father did. But there's a fucked up thing where I'm like, well, I want to see what she says. Yeah, about this right fucked up experience. It's like kind of why I want to see Mulaney's. Oh, I saw I, uh, I saw him at City Winery. Uh-huh. Not right after. I would have killed to see him yeah. first stop. Uh-huh. I, that's the thing. I want to see the comics that I love st- struggle or work through something. <laughs> right. You know, because it's mm. just like it's seeing like a god bleed. It's like yeah, let's see them figure stuff out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my favorite thing to do. I, I, I my wife went to see him. Uh, I couldn't go. I had spots or something when he was doing City Winery, like very early. On. Yeah, I think when Rock was there. I think I think Rock opened or. Someone opened for him that was like ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Like they hopped on the show. Yeah, yeah, and it was that city winery for like you know that that twelve week run or whatever the hell he did. Um, and she said it was good, but I want to see. I want to see. That was a year ago, I think. Now it was just. It was just like I think one part which definitely won't be in his special was he just like he talked about when the tickets went on sale, mm-hmm. the website crashed, uh-huh. and he was talking about how when he heard that it crashed, he's like, "Yeah, it fucking crashed. That's right, I'm John <laughs> Mulaney." And he really like showed uh-huh. that side of him that is not appealing, uh-huh. and that's what was so good about it. Uh-huh. I had that. I had a, a showing that side of me moment last night. Yeah, I was on stage at Paramount, and I think like it's probably like thirty minutes into the set. In, in like in part of the set talking about cancer where I'm like relaying to the crowd when I was talking to my parents about getting cancer. Yeah. And this guy, I, and I'd seen people like film, like taking pictures and stuff. And I can tell if someone's taking a picture, like I'll, I'll look at it for a little bit to see if it goes down or not. Sure. And I saw a corner of my eye. This guy just had his phone up like the whole time for like five minutes. Mm. And in the middle, I couldn't, stand it and at some point at the like once i hit the punchline i had like about talking to my dad like i was like all right i gotta come out of this fucking set real quick and be yeah like, are you recording <laughs> I'm like let's turn that off and like i had this like this moment of like i could feel myself being angry yeah and uh luckily like luckily i called myself being angry and i was like like because I, I spoke to him in, like an angry tone i was like what are you doing man yeah are you re- recording this let's delete that shit and uh, uh, it was like dead silence. <laughs> it's 1,200 people quiet, like yeah. waiting for me to like freak out or have a meltdown or something. Because I had relayed to them I was on shrooms like, at the beginning of the show, right? And so I was like <laughs> going through this emotional <laughs> shit. And then luckily someone yelled out, Nimesh, it's my birthday. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> like thank you, God. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> because the- like, well, well the, the cancer stories of how I found out I had cancer on my birthday. And so I said to that guy, I was like, well, hope you don't get cancer. And that luckily like saved the Yeah, room. yeah, yeah. Like bailed me out of that situation. <laughs> Cause I was like, bro, I, like I, I thank God for that guy saving my life. Cause I definitely, that could have gone sideways. It reminds me of, there was a, there was a Dane Cook album back in the day where he really like gets mad and all his memories. Like, if you keep this up, we're going to throw you out. Mm-hmm. And then his save was like, doesn't feel like you're at the, the, the the dinner table with your divorced parents or something like he had a save yeah. that it was so well scripted. I'm like, Oh, you must have to get angry. A lot of shows you have a, a perfect save. Yes. But the phone is tough. I've, I've had people that are like, Oh, my friend couldn't be here. So I want her to see the show. too. Right. And then you tell them to stop. And then they put, when they bring the phone back up, yes, then you're stuck. Yes. It's a very, it's that has to stop. I know that's one of your, sec- yeah. this has got to stop. Like stop, but it's never going to stop. My thing is this. Okay. So it's not going to stop. I think recording will stop or it should stop. Well, yeah. then you're going to have to take people's phones. You, you, you're you're going to get 1200 people. Mm-hmm. There's going to be one in the bunch yeah. who hasn't learned the code. Yeah. Who's just going to sell my bootleg on fucking the streets. DVD of Nimesh Patel doing seven minutes. You know, it's like, yeah. Well, like my point is like, what is your, what I wanted to talk to the guy about, what I felt coming up in me was just like beyond 
you putting it somewhere and it, like i'm not saying anything wild it's just like sure. something i'm controlling i'm telling you i'm gonna put this out in like two weeks or whatever you know like you spent a good amount of money to be here and you're just and like and like maybe as a shrooms or like the existential crisis i've been having of just like what are we all doing what is it all for sure <laughs> like like do you not get that you should just be present like i don't understand like how you don't know that man i think it's funny being on shrooms telling someone else to be present like let me get you some shrooms and i think you'll understand this a little bit yes, better like you about being in the moment you should you should be in the moment i felt very in the moment that's the thing yeah it's like i knew i've been in situations before where i'm just like all right i gotta take a breath and like get back to this before my mind goes a million miles ahead and i like destroy this guy you know and so what's what's the maddest you get i mean do you do you get a temper do no you I, I, I definitely have anger in me for sure yeah uh, but are you a yeller are you a cursor how do you get angry are you mean i i use well on stage i'm not i try to be very like composed like yeah i, I I am very composed on stage because yeah, I know that the room is dependent on my energy mm -hmm. at the end of the day. There's definitely been moments where I've just been like flustered with anger because I know I can't act the way I, my instinct is telling me to act. Yeah. Like I, like I can be very mean, like sure. every, every comedian has like a very strong capability of exacting the perfect thing to say to somebody to destroy them it could be super cruel and super mean and like destroy someone's like entire emotional well-being you know sure we all have that yeah, yeah, yeah. uh deep within us uh -huh. <laughs> you know and like it's not something i but use or whatever the hell it is but my anger if it's not if it's like with people in general it used to be like i can yell pretty like i have a very capable yelling voice and screaming voice and all that shit or i can be ice cold and just destroy you so when i'm on stage and i'm i feel anger i have to i get flustered that's my emotional response because i can't be angry of course because that would destroy it's everything. not funny yeah it's not nothing's funny, funny about real Act, actual anger. anger is not funny yeah, yeah, yeah and uh uh it becomes a. Uh, I also know that anger is very destructive Mm -hmm. as an emotion in general like sure. throughout the world it's like half the reason the country is the way it is because people are angry don't know how to behave about it i think about i think about michael richards at the laugh factory you know it was what he was saying no doubt yes but it was also the rage mm -hmm. i mean it was so it was so hateful and angry <laughs> yeah. it was just awful to witness yes it was like what like that is a strange thing to have in you He's probably cooked up. It probably it was, it was super supernatural anger. Yeah, a little yeah, bit. What's what bothers me about people like that getting angry is like, what did you work so hard for? Mm -hmm. You got five hundred million dollars. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like if you're in that bad a place, just you can leave. You don't have to do your spot right now. If you're really having a, a real day, right. Michael Richards. Yeah, yeah. Go home. But he you take know, a nap. Like Dave says, like had a bad spot. You know. Yeah, <laughs> such a good. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, we've all been there. So like the anger of it, the my anger is like uh, on stage. Like I was just very flustered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last night, and anytime I'm angry on stage, it's a, it's a it comes out as flustered. Or I'm like in disbelief almost. That yeah. I, a that I'm angry, and then B that the thing that has happened is happening, and I get mad at myself for being angry. Mm -hmm. Like I, I should be more emotionally mature. I just wish sometimes that my anger supersedes the like cutting line, and it's because my father was just a yeller. Uh -huh. He was just a yeller, so I just feel it in me, and I just want to scream, "Shut uh -huh. the fuck up!" Mm -hmm. And sometimes I, it's very because I'll be like, "Shut the fuck up," and it's funny, and it gets you know a little, a little laugh. Right. And then other times I didn't, I didn't hide it, and I go, "Shut the fuck up!" Right. And the audience goes, "Whoa!" Yes. <sighs> um. Welcome to The Downside. My name is Marcus Terezi. <laughs> I'm here with my very special guest, Nimesh Patel. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I, uh, You talk about doing shrooms. I, yesterday, so Brandon Sagalo came up to me, mm -hmm. and he had a bag of not very appealing looking edible uh, of like fruit fruit roll up type shit. You know, you had to unstick it. And it was like 2 p.m., 3 p.m. He offered some and I was like, I didn't really want to get high, but I was like, be cool, be cool. You're at, <laughs> you're at the comedy festival. Right. And so he gave me a little piece. And as I'm putting it in my mouth, he's, I was like, how much is it? And he said, though, the whole bag is a thousand milligrams. Jesus. Now for me, weed. 
Yeah. yeah, yeah. For me, at this point of the day, if I want to be sober by the time of my show, two point five to five is what I'm looking for. <laughs> right. And so I even like I I secretly like only took half and I spit out the other half in a napkin uh-huh. just to be chill, right? Not to feel like I was wasting this gift that he had given me, right? And I was so fucked up. Thirty minutes later, oh really? I was so fucked up. <laughs> I went to uh, Barry's boot camp as this treadmill kind of workout class, mm-hmm. and I was like, I kept going to the wrong treadmill every time we left, came back. And I was high for the shows. <laughs> and like, I would never be that high. I don't like being yeah, high. It's not a fun feeling. Let alone for this, for this thing. This is still is a, a important to me mm-hmm. to do well on these shows. And I did not like, uh-huh. and I, I couldn't shake it. It's, you know, I had coffee. You got to eat. Yeah. You got to eat food. It's just to eat fatty food. When but what about you? you? I mean, do you, do you like doing? Uh, no, I, I, I forget where I was. That made me say I'll never get high on stage again. Yeah. Uh, there's definitely, I've definitely been high on stage on purpose. Uh, and the one t- the one of the first times I did it, I was in DC. This was like probably like three years ago, four years ago. Uh huh. Like pre pandemic, I had so, I, I had like a, a weekend at uh, the Baron, Beer Baron. Yeah, in, yeah I've been in, Beer Baron. DC. Uh-huh. Uh huh. With the sticky floors and all that shit. And uh, they, they had papered the room. Um, and so it was like a full room, but it was like, not a lot of people who knew who I was like, a, sure. but the first show I'd done, I was recording my album. The first show I'd done went really well. So I was like, Oh, I got this in the bag. I had someone to give me some DC weed. So I smoked a bunch of DC weed outside of the venue yeah. like, in between shows. Second show I was fucking like, I feel bad for that crowd. Like if anyone from that show is listening, I'm sorry. I was fucking <laughs> zooted, like out of my mind. Like I, I, I listened back to it. Like God damn, it was all. It was like probably like sixty percent quiet. You know, like of, it was bad. Were you laughing though? At least I was having a <laughs> mediocre time because because I knew I was high as fuck, and I was trying. Like at that point, I wasn't mature enough to admit that I was high as fuck, and like I thought I could still land the plane you know yeah yeah, I, yeah. I, I was so fucked up i thought i was i was so confident in myself were you trying to hold on to the act to like or were you letting it loose i was letting loose i was just talking and bullshitting like because the the first show had gone so well i was like okay now i can sc- score some additional new stuff or see sure. how funny i actually am that we it like did me in i was like god damn that was brutal i'm sorry i put that crowd through that and then uh i think another one or two times like I was too high on stage and like it went well, it went fine. But I was like, yeah, I don't want this feeling like I don't like being super self-conscious on stage or whatever. Yeah. Well, that's it's is this the moment I start going like, wait, are they laughing at the joke or am I being weird right now? And they're laughing at once I have that thought, it's over. Yes. I'm just I'm just like kind of I see myself outside and I'm not in it. Yeah. That's what happened last night where like I never I never went on stage high on shrooms before. And why did no? Why did you? Why did you do this? Why did I do it last night? Yeah, because it's four twenty. Okay, and, and uh, we're in Austin, and I had relayed to the crowd, like uh, the fans, the whoever were coming, that I was going to be inebriated before, the, like, like just on uh, Instagram, like, hey, it's four twenty. <laughs> I got a full chocolate bar full of shrooms. Let's have some fun, <laughs> and uh, uh, and also like I was very. I remain confident in my ability to perform on, yeah, shrooms. Yeah. on shrooms, like no problem. Sure. It's actually a lot of fun because the, I mean, I had a lot of fun throughout because I was like being goofier than I normally would be like, just having like, mm-hmm. they definitely unlocked some kind of um, self-consciousness that I, that I was like, con- like happy about. Like I enjoy the self-consciousness. Like, Oh man, I did something really stupid. That was pretty funny. Like yeah. I was thinking that uh, while remaining in the, in the set but the when that guy made me annoyed it hyper focused my anger and like became i became very aware of it very quickly sure to the point where even after like the moment had was done i was back in the set back in my mind i was still thinking man i was pretty annoyed just now like i wanted to like leave and be like Motherfucker, like you don't understand what just happened. <laughs> you know, like I like I part of me is like, does the crowd understand mm-hmm. what I'm going what I'm feeling right now? Because they definitely did not. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's hard for them to they, they, it doesn't seem like a big deal to them. No. It's just a concert. That's why I just don't think it's gonna go away. And it's just like, well, these things are gonna exist out there. Yeah. 
uh, well, uh, for those for those tuning in for the first time, this is a podcast where we explore negativity. We let ourselves be uh, complain, kvetch, moan. Mm. Um, if you're a fan, join the Patreon, patreon.com slash downside for extra episodes and uh, my clean comedy special, Patreon exclusive, The Rats Are In Me. Um, I, I I did want to bring up the, uh, well, first I am drinking the, the Chuck Norris the Chuck water. Chuck Norris water, man. This, this, I was at a, for the Moon Tower, for those who don't know, Moon Tower Comedy Festival, it's owned by JFL now, big comedy festival in Austin. This is my first year doing it. You've been here before, I, I imagine. Not. This is my, oh, you haven't. My first year as well. It's a good time. Yeah. But Chuck Norris has a water. Uh, <laughs> it says it's called Sea Force. Terror, really, oh, way too much going on on uh-huh. the bottle. And it's just like it's listed as premium artesian water. And in my mind, Chuck Norris fans, they drink water from the sink, from a well, bent yeah. over. <laughs> like it's not this. Uh, but you had, you went on stage uh, for the show we did together on Wednesday mm-hmm. and looked up some chat GPT jokes. Yes. Some Chuck Norris water jokes. Yes. What were they again? Do you remember them? Uh, Chuck, Wa- Chuck Norris is. A uh, water company does not have a filtration system. Chuck Norris's water filters itself uh-huh. <laughs> out of respect. Yeah. <laughs> when does Chuck Norris water freeze? When Chuck Norris tells it yeah, to freeze? Yeah, it's, it's like perfect, actually. Kind of like very accurate yeah. Chuck Norris shit about water. Do you? I, I was with Luke Monez last night. And I, I followed enough about AI. Like I listened to one or two tech podcasts. Uh-huh. Luke clearly reads books uh-huh. on it. And... And very seriously, he was just, he was like, he said, I, I believe that this chat GPT stuff, it's going to, it's going to change society far more than the pandemic ever did. Yes. He says he's, he, he basically, his eyes said societal collapse. And I was stoned from the fucking thing from earlier in the day. Uh So I like it just, it hit my heart. I like, like shivers of, oh, I can't think about sometimes I went through a big existential phase in college just, 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 I couldn't let go of, oh, when I die, uh-huh. what's going to happen? And part of being an adult was just like, sometimes when I have that thought, I just have to be like, no, 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 no. Look over here. Look over here. Cause there's no end to the thought. No. There's no like nice conclusion to it. Mm-hmm. And I had to do that last night. Cause he, he really just put the fear of, oh, maybe everything I think will happen in my life is going to collapse and there will be war i i don't know if it's that extreme but i do think uh the l- former point of it definitely radical changing society rapidly and uh i just see so many jobs going away mm-hmm. we have no not we don't even have a belief in in universal income at, at least in america no. and all these jobs are going to go away so how are people going to make money and the I, I just assume the rich will capitalize on it and and the classes, the middle class will be destroyed. I mean, sometimes that's what it takes. Sure. For uh, uh, change to come at some point, you know, these incremental changes we're trying to make uh, in society aren't going to be enough. Yeah. Enough people need to be without hope for the world to actually change it's just whether whether they'll have enough digital police dogs roaming the streets to keep everyone in line yeah by that point i last i checked you could still just turn computers off (laughs) sure (laughs) sure all right (laughs) we we had a good run but i liked your joke basically you 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 i had the thought of Oh, maybe live entertainment will thrive. Maybe a lot of this stuff will be faked, uh-huh. but then like personal live entertainment and then your, your joke about, uh, I don't want to ruin the joke, but you do did tweet it. I did tweet it. It's uh comedy will change because, you know, only per- chat GPT can effectively write like strong monologue jokes. Yeah. They can write jokes like the Chuck Norris shit and it can write, you know, I'm, I think chat GPT four can probably do like, a lot of Fallon's work. Like, of course. You know, no disrespect to any of the writers there. I'm just saying it's like th- those jokes are not cookie cutter, but they are like set up punchline. You can understand how they're constructed if you study them long enough. Yeah. And I worked at Update, okay? Weekend Update, Saturday Night Live. So I know what I'm talking about. Uh, but the the only stuff that's going to remain is like the personal Stand up, yeah. Because anyone talking about topical shit, like everyone's already doing the most topical stuff. Like if you're on Instagram and TikTok, you see everyone's got clips. Yeah. Oh shit, the Dalai Lama did this or whatever. You know, it's like everyone's got that take. So the only stuff that's going to matter is personal. 
because chat GPT and more so i think it's just seeing it live for the potential to fail you can't see a chat gpt take shrooms before their big show at the paramount no and get mad at someone filming right chat yeah. gpt will make their phone explode yes if it's upset about it filming <laughs> if only but yeah like that like that that is what i that's why i'm that's why i'm like not too worried about comedians sure stand up live entertainment like that's going to remain those are going to be the only kind of things that remain uh it's like if the pandemic proved anything anyone that came out of pandemic is like, entertainment is recession proof mm -hmm. people the worst unless it's like you're in a great depression and no one has any money whatsoever but even then like speakeasy still existed of course but look yeah. at the, the failure of the metaverse the like the quiet just you know mark zuckerberg was Turn like that off we see you we see you zuck you fired everybody you fucking dork i got so many messages about <laughs> we got our first metaverse comedy club and i was like nah nah, nah no way <laughs> that's not happening uh i think the i think a lot of people did a lot of those metaverse comedy shows and they got a lot of money like sure big big name people did that stuff and they got their bag good for you but i think in general i don't think people are ready to sit in their apartment with a thing on their head and like okay let's laugh at this shit those are some i, I was doing the zoom heavily there were like i got into some different companies and there was one day i did four hours back to back of zoom shows and I, by the end i was sweating uh -huh. and i was alone uh -huh. i was just alone four one hour shows yeah yeah yeah. and God, and man. i'm just i would lose my voice because you know this is inanimate object that you're just like pushing and pushing and pushing mm -hmm. <sighs> I'm sorry you went through that. Thank you. It was the, the pandemic was toughest on me overall. You you were in that uh, Tucker Carlson trailer. I was in that Tucker Carlson so, trailer. Well, okay, so this was on Fox has a, what is it a streaming site now? I don't know. What the this is where Roseanne's special is located. Uh -huh. yeah, Fox has a new subscription based streaming site, and uh, Tucker Carlson was pushing a documentary called what was it? Comedy is dead. I refuse to know and learn the name of it, but yeah, <laughs> and it was like. You know, it's it's basically like no one can be comedians anymore. And they pulled clips from everything. They, they did uh, crowd work clips from my friend Troy Bond, mm -hmm. who couldn't be more uh, more anti anti Fox on uh -huh. his in his whole act. But then they pulled you from from Joe Rogan. Yes. And and it's you just talking about it's impossible. Sometimes it's hard because it's hard to talk about people being over offended or talking about comedy without easily f being able to feed into this particular narrative. Right. You can't say anything anymore. That's what that also has to stop the mm -hmm. idea. You can't say anything anymore. Yeah. Sometimes you can't say bad things yeah. that, that, yeah. are, that don't have a punchline and aren't necessarily funny. Like it's, it's never a great joke. Anyone's defending. It's yeah. always the worst. It's just like, uh, it's, I think I said, I said this on Rogan's podcast too, where it's just like there are consequences to your actions. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> like that's that's not that's not like a new thing that happens to me. So I mean to anybody. So when I was on when they took my shit from Rogan, they completely took it out of context, and then they they didn't ask me. Sure. Uh, obviously, they didn't have to because it was Joe's clip. But it was like that idea of making someone a martyr for something is bugs me so much you know like i'm doing fine of course <laughs> of course it's, it's always you know it's the community that's doing pretty well who yeah did w when you found out were you like were you pissed no i was just like all right well i, I messaged i didn't message him i tweeted at the show tucker carlson like hey man you didn't this you is texted tucker hey hey brother I went, good to see you last weekend. <laughs> I went through my email to see who <laughs> their producer was. Yeah. Because their producer had emailed me in 2018 when the Columbia stuff happened. Oh, yeah. To come on their show and talk about it. And I was like, uh, for a half a second, I debated it. Some friends like, go on that show, man. Fucking roast them. Other, other people, wiser people, were like, don't do it. And I was like, you're right. I don't Because there's no way I was going to come out of that net positive. Yeah. If anything, it would have been neutral. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a chance that it would have been net negative. I would have had to have been like a right wing comedian, you know, or someone who was like, yeah. just doubles down on cancel culture being the, like my defining thing. And uh, I don't what, what would your pronouns joke be? My pronouns are kiss my ass. That's Roseanne's. <laughs> oh, really? I feel I feel like every every right wing comedian needs to have one. My pronouns are my my pronouns are. I'm too tired for this. 
<laughs> sure. Hey, that, that'll be that. That'll be that. And they'd be like, you know what? That's a pretty nice perspective. I'm old. I'm old. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's yeah. my pronoun. Old. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I respect whatever the fuck, whatever dick you want to suck and put in your mouth or ass, whatever, do whatever the fuck you want. I don't give a shit. It'd at be all. nice if if that's that would be like the the right wing comic kind of having a breakdown on stage. Uh -huh. Would be like. You know what? Just suck whatever you want. Yeah. I don't actually care about this. I can't pretend anymore. It's so it's so like uh, funny to to me to see people who care about something so not. But they don't. My thing is that anyone in the arts, because mm -hmm. like even those, because I worked with, I work with a lot of those uh, uh, right wing comics who I did earlier, and I'm like, we do have a thing in common, which is. We just like the eyeballs or we, we like to express while being witnessed. Mm -hmm. And if you are into that, you work with a wide breadth of people. Yeah. And so I don't believe any of them. No. I don't believe Roseanne. I mean, please, you, she was in fucking she had a TV show. Right. She's she, she works with these people. It's just a money grab. It's it's like a, a turn, a heel turn that a lot of them want to take because for the money and for the. I think that the feeling of it's like a nihilistic feeling is that it doesn't matter. Like speaking of Tucker Carlson, all those texts leaked of him saying like Trump is a fucking idiot. Yep. I hate this guy. Yep. And then he does an interview with Trump the next day and he's like, <laughs> oh, oh my God, his Elon Musk one was, but, but it's like no one, it doesn't matter. No. It doesn't matter. I mean, there's literally texts him saying, I hate this guy. And I don't know. I, I, it doesn't matter. That's the feeling overall. Yes. Fox settled the case with with uh, Dominion. Uh, with Dominion, and like it doesn't matter. None of it matters. That money, it's a big sum of money. Doesn't matter. That's really what the. That's why I, the overarching thing with cancel culture. Sorry to say that. <clears throat> I want to spit every time I say I know, that. But that and woke. <laughs> it's like uh, uh, it's just a calculation of bottom line. It's like if. The people who get quote unquote canceled just didn't drive enough revenue for the people canceling them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For it to be a, a business positive decision. So sorry, you're done. Yeah, Whereas yeah, yeah. If like people, oh well, we got enough. That's the only reason Fox exists, is because they get enough money saying the stupid shit that uh, uh, they don't have to worry about canceling anybody. I think it's. A, I feel the same way where people go where they go cancel culture isn't real mm -hmm. i'm like no it's it is people have to have changes it's market but it's all yeah. economic yes like people talk about it like it's moral mm -hmm. cancel culture isn't real it's like well no this person did can no longer do this particular market so it did shift something mm -hmm. changed but no they if you mean they never worked again yeah that that's the the misunderstanding that is the it's just money it's just money the only person i said this on rogan i'll say it again is the only person that Tucker Carlson used this clip. <laughs> got got canceled was Jamal Khashoggi. And that's like almost a joke, but it's also true. Like he died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he got beheaded because he was talking shit to somebody and saying things. Yeah. The rest of us are fine. Like Columbia, quote unquote, canceled me. I sold out Paramount last night. Like I'm full of Asian people, by the way. So it's like, am I canceled? <sighs> Sure. I think that when you say that, it's just like, does it just, does, do certain societies get in a place where it's so good that then you make up these things? I mean, you know, I think if, if, if Jamal yes. Khashoggi had been beheaded by, you know, an American, maybe people would be like, okay, we can't say cancel culture anymore. Right. But you're right. You know, it's like, it's, we are very fortunate that we can say words are hurting my feelings to the point where we're going to get someone's job or, very fortunate where that's an option that yeah. like like uh arguing about words you can or can't say is an option most places you can't is this is what you can say this is what you can't say otherwise you get your head cut off yeah yeah, yeah. america is the best but it's also like what a what a rich problem to have <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay i'm worried about saying stuff yeah what a luxury yeah yeah this is a fun um podcast to complain about things yeah it is <laughs> i enjoy complaining i re i forgot that part of my uh uh emotional register please lean in <laughs> um you're you're uh you your dad your parents got divorced when you were two correct well i did some thorough research oh yeah uh -huh. it was funny i saw we, we ran into each other here or we were in 
at the airport. We land in the same plane. Yes. And you went right to the gym. Mm -hmm. And I work out, I work out pretty regularly, but the moment you went, I was like, fuck, I gotta, I gotta go work out too. <laughs> fuck. I, I thought it was the only comic like taking care of myself. And then I go there and there's like eight, eight comics fucking yeah. working out the moment they landed. I'm like, shit. No, nah, for me, it was, my room wasn't ready. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, uh, and I, I was annoyed as uh, for at first, like when I landed, I was like, where's my car? Mm. Uh, and it, I had. I had no sleep the night prior because I went to sleep like one. My flight was at seven, so I was up at like yeah, it was five. Early flight, and uh, and I didn't make it to JFK in time to uh, get a meal in. So I ate on the plane a little bit, but I was still a little grumpy when I landed. I couldn't get a car, and I was like, "Where the fuck is my car?" Then I had to get an Uber, and I was like, fuck, "Why I spend money when this is supposed to be a car here for me?" Yeah. And then when I got to the hotel, the room wasn't ready, and I'm like. Every comedian here is here for the festival. Like, I'm not sure why you don't have rooms ready for all uh -huh, of us. Like, uh -huh. I understand it's sold out or whatever, but like, come on. So to keep me from sitting in that annoyed space, I was like, well, you have a gym, right? And they're like, yeah. I was like, does it have a shower? I was like, yeah. I was like, okay, well, I'll just go do that. Yeah. And then I did that for like an hour or so because normally I work out like 40, 45 minutes, um, but like an hour, an hour and five because I was like, let me just kill as much time as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in that working out, I was like, man, I was being a real dickhead. <laughs> like no, you, you, didn't, you didn't reveal it. I didn't say anything. <laughs> no, before, like when at the front, at the, at the, the front, desk. At yeah, the yeah, desk, yeah. Like they were like, well, check-in's not at four until four. I was like, I'm aware. Do I strike you as someone that doesn't go to hotels? <laughs> it was annoying. This hotel, it's like, two, it's two hotels in one, and they yes. keep insisting that. And I'm like, no, it's it's one hotel. Yeah, one side is shittier than the other. Uh, so it's fine. That yeah, it's one side, it's a red carpet. One side, it's a blue carpet. You're blue. <laughs> yeah, I'm red. It's black. Is yours, yeah. is yours better? I don't know. I haven't seen the... Mine's small. But I, I requested a suite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because uh, when I do the Paramount, I can request a suite too. Well, I mean, I'm paying for it. <laughs> oh, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, like I had to pay the difference, but it's like I'm. I spend so much time in hotel rooms. Of course, please. That, that it's like I need space just from like walking around because my one part of my writing process is like on some nights when I'm on the road a lot, and there's not parties every night. Like I get high after the show. Yeah, and I'll just pace around my room. And like listen to music and just talk to myself. Really? And I just need that space. Yeah. Like physical space is like do that. I'll just be if if someone was watching from outside, like they just see an Indian guy with his headphones on, just sure, sure. Sometimes the music will kick and I'm just you know. Do you like, ever I talk to myself sometimes? I did this yesterday. It's so embarrassing. I'm talking to myself and then I pass like a person. Mm -hmm. And I'm always have my headphones in. So I pretend for <laughs> like three seconds that I'm on the phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, uh-huh. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, I think I got the Oscar for that role because blah, 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 blah. blah. <laughs> and uh, I like, I, I for on the road, I get stoned, light stoned during the day. Mm -hmm. And I'll do an activity and that's when I do like my writing. Got it. No, it's notes in my phone. I can't do, excuse me, before shows. I can't get high before shows. Yeah. Like I, not from my, my brain's all fucked up, but from, uh, uh, I know that it will, I'll forget something or I'm not at my peak energy levels before mm. a show, uh, my pre-show routine. I'm like, I try to LeBron, like my pre-show shit, you know, it's like very regimented. Yeah. Lunch around noon. I gotta take a nap. I gotta get my gym in. I gotta shower. Uh, and then I got to like write like 30 minutes before the show, like just like what, just put the set list together. Yeah, yeah, that's what I do. You know, it's just like a very structured kind of thing. Yeah. And then uh, the show happens, then I'll get high afterwards sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all that to say, I need the space. And are you so, listening back to the sets or are you? I wish I wish I did. I have a new thing transcribes it pretty well. Uh huh. And I can I can scroll through it mm -hmm. and just look through what I want to. When how quick What's the turnaround? right away what's the app 10 minutes it's called transcribe uh, -huh. uh so yeah basically it, it writes out kind of everything i said and then it breaks it into chunks so if i go like ooh, let me hear how that played what's the app look like oh that's pretty good it's and it just, does a pretty decent job it's called transcribe yeah that's the app on the mm -hmm. apple store yeah, yeah, yeah how much is it i uh, i think the it's free but like i buy like 10 hours 
for 20 bucks or something or you can do i'm, I'm thinking of just subscribing full time yeah yeah because it's because especially the the worst is when i have a two show i want to sometimes i want to know some stuff from that first show mm. before the second show when i do this mm -hmm. i can figure it out real fast right 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 um i definitely got to get on that uh I, I usually put my i send my sets to the rev.com if i need it yeah yeah, yeah. but if, no this is good if that's automatic then sure. yeah yeah transcribe please sponsor this yeah um so your your parents got divorced when you were two. Mm -hmm. You you don't really. Do you think you have snapshots snapshots of your dad in your mind, like when you were that age, or no. two? There's no memories. There's zero. You've never met him since. You've Correct. never, and you've never wanted to. You don't even know if he's. Do you know if he's alive or dead? He's, he's alive. Uh, he is alive. He's alive. Uh, Where? Jersey. Um. From what I understand, uh, would be funny if he saw you in the Tucker Carlson thing. It would. If that's be, what he was. It would be fucking. Hilarious. And that's when he reached out. He was like, "Hey, I can't believe you made it so far." I know. Uh, uh, I know he's got he got remarried and all that kind of shit. Kids. Uh, yes, from what I understand. Who's giving you this information? Your your mom? I'll just no. I'll just hear a piecemeal from like random. Like my the last I heard was from. Uh, a wedding planner who my cousin was friends with who was ending up planning that his other kids wedding or something jesus christ right and i'll be like what well that's great <laughs> but i don't need to know all this shit going on but like the uh the rub is like i can't care i'm not gonna reach out i refuse to do that uh i never is the thing to. about pride like do you want do you have anything inside you that wants him to reach out? No, Nothing. not at all. I think part of it is like, all right, well, uh, I guess I don't understand that part of manhood where it's like, okay, like cold blooded, but that might be where I get it. Well, I could just, I can be very cold and just like, yeah, you're out of my life forever. I can do that. Yeah. Uh, what you do with friends, exes? What do you mean? I've done it with exes for sure. Yeah. And just like, all right, we're done. That kind of thing. So it's like, I know that exists in me. Mm hmm. And uh, uh, the desire to open up all that beyond it just being like, oh, what happened? Like my mom remarried, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the My dad, the guy that raised us, is like God, you know? So it's like, for me, it's like, I, I, don't, I don't ever want him to think that I'm lacking something. Yeah. You know I mean? Oh, I get that. I get that. And it's more like... All right, well, to what end? It's not like I'm going to establish another relationship. I'm barely holding on to the ones I got, you know? I just want to, I, I, I never met my dad's dad, mm -hmm. at least, and my dad had a fucked up family. Mm -hmm. And so I feel, I think because of that, I've never really had an interest in my heritage. Mm -hmm. Like I know my great grandpa's name and I've never bothered you know, there's a, they, someone made a family tree at one point. I never gave a shit. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes wonder if it's, whether it's a connection that would like make me feel, I don't know, more part of the world, part of the, it's, it's to not, for me to not really be interested of, of where I came from. Mm -hmm. Like literally the, the human beings that resulted in my existence. I wonder if I have a detachment that would make me feel something good. I don't know. I don't know. Like, like I think if I had a kid, what if you found out you were a descendant of like a billionaire and that all he wanted was like <laughs> for you to like acknowledge that he existed and that, like, Oh, here's the sure. keys to the castle. Sure. <laughs> you know, I, uh, you know, there's Italian somewhere. There's, there's mob somewhere. And I'm like, if, I'm sure it's interesting, but for some reason I don't really give a shit at all. Huh. But, uh, I, I, I'm sure latent in me is some curiosity, but yeah, I got too much other shit I'm not curious about that I'd much rather be curious about. Yeah. To focus my energy on that, you know? Sure. That's where I'm at. And your mom and, and your stepdad are still married? Yeah. And you refer to him as dad? Yes. Yeah. Stepdad almost offends me. Sure, I get that. You know? I had a stepdad. I called him, I just called him Bill. Uh, yeah, that would be bad if I did that. But <laughs> <laughs> it would. Uh, but yeah, like it's. How old were you when they got married? My parents. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Four, maybe. Four okay. Or five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something so like that's that. from that's from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, like I, but I don't have any memories of. I have very few memories of childhood. 
like i'm sure like they're blacked out i'm sure they're repressed why that i won't talk about okay uh but yeah there's like very few memories of childhood like, yeah and it's not it's concerning because i don't know if i went through anything physical that like like that I'd like fall on my head a bunch of times that i don't remember shit you know yeah so uh uh all that like when they got married all that kind of stuff is all just like out of my head like there's no memories there but i think what's what's it, my father he had a he had a heart surgery last year and i had that thought speaking of like not being interested in my heritage or like knowing a lot about my family was oh i'd love to know the full medical history mm. of my entire family mm -hmm. and it's it's just like oh that is the part that is good to know yes i would like to know i i suddenly go like yeah you know what i'd like to know how everyone died <laughs> i would love a document of how everyone died uh -huh. i know on my mom's side there's like a lot of suicides so i'm like okay uh -huh. I, I can keep an eye on that one when i got the cancer diagnosis what my uh sister did some digging and found out that i think my paternal grandfather or something had died of cancer yeah something I'm like oh shit all right old uh, that makes sense <laughs> yeah like oh that now it makes sense that i had it uh because like no one on my well, on my mom's side her aunt had her aunt passed away from leukemia but i don't know if how, like so i know cancer's in the family tree somewhere sure sure uh uh but like that to echo what you said yes it would be good to know how everyone's yeah, it's like my dad's dad died of a heart attack, and I always want to ask, like, like crudely, I'm like, was he fat? <laughs> was he? Was he? Did he eat shit? Like, I want to know, like, nothing. I'm, it won't happen to me like that, right? right? But it's also like, what can you control? You're sure. You're controlling what you can control, of course. And uh, of outside, course, uh, like, therefore, I don't give a fuck about who, how they died or what they did. I know that my mom's got arthritis. It probably explains why my knees hurt. Uh huh. I got to mitigate that. Uh, uh my mom's dad had a quadruple bypass at like 70 years old so how, I, I, how old 70 oh 70 yeah, yeah. i thought he said seven i was like no, god no, no, damn no no, no no uh like 70 years old <laughs> if, if he had a quadruple bypass in when he was seven <laughs> they would have had to invent the uh, quadruple bypass like 30 years prior to when they actually did, you know, like he yeah, yeah, yeah. 1933 when he was seven. But anyway, he'd be like the first pig's heart. Yes. <laughs> he would not, I would not be here today if he had a quadruple <laughs> bypass at seven. But like, I know that, but Indian people in general, we have poor heart health. Um, it's like South Asian Americans have poor heart health. And why is that? Because we're like skinny fat. Like yeah. All our, our food, at least my generation, the generation above, like, vegetarian and all that but it's like cooked in oil and like mm. you eat bread and spices for breakfast <laughs> like it's not good for you sure and like the, our so you think american sugar is bad american sweets are bad like have an indian dessert it's just like gulab jamun is one of the most famous desserts it's literally a, a donut is a munchkin sugar ball dipped in syrup yeah and that's like you could eat like three four of those and that's like dessert it's like no you are eating diabetes you know, mm -hmm. and so like Indian Americans have this high incidence rate of uh, heart disease as it is because on the outside we're skinny. Yeah. But in like my grandpa was skinny. So sure. He had, a, you know, a, a, a belly that developed, you know, but he was also like 95. But yeah. So we don't necessarily see us being unhealthy. Sure. So it's sure. on the inside. But, you know, I take care of myself now because I know that that's happening. And on beyond it being in my genetic dispositions, like, why wouldn't I do that? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't I take care of myself if I can? So when you found out you this had been a very funny podcast, by the way, I'm sorry, Josh. Uh, I think I'm, the visual of the, the seven year old getting a quintuple bypass <laughs> got a couple laughs in there. I so when you you found out the about the cancer, mm -hmm. it's uh, was it one testicle? One testicle. Righty is gone. Special coming out. Is out. It's called Lucky Lefty. It's on YouTube. Please go watch it. Oh yeah. I. Uh, so you 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 found out. You said you had had a, a hernia before. I had. This is the arrogance of uh, of myself. Yeah. Of like. And I'm on. I was on the road, and I was like doing a bunch of shows, and my balls hurt a little bit, but I was like, nah, I've just been working out like a motherfucker. That's yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got. A I got. I got a hernia from a deadlift. I, I know that feeling. You know, like, like yeah. that's all it is. And like, 
I've had a hernia before. That was in 2016. Like <laughs> when I got the Oscars writing job, mm-hmm. I was like, I'm going to the Oscars. I gotta get in fucking shape. <laughs> I'm gonna be for the writers' room. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be the Oscars and be fucking pumping. I'm gonna have me in my tux. People are gonna see me when the credits flash at the very end. Yes, no, at the governor's ball when I sit by myself because everyone around me is mega famous. Yes, and I'm like, what? Oh yeah, this is not every. I think <laughs> I'm in a super fit writer over there. Yeah, I think I'm in a nice tux. Meanwhile, everyone's been dressed like Tom Ford. You of know? course, of course. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I got my parents got me this. You know, it was a, my thirtieth <laughs> birthday gift <laughs> off the rack at Ralph Lauren for sale. You know, like yeah. <laughs> Were you in shape? Were you in good shape at that point? Uh, yes, I was in good shape, but yeah. I had a hernia. <laughs> That's what it cost. Did me. you have the hernia while you're at the Oscars? I had the hernia. Uh, January 2016. Oscars were February 2016. So I was working out a lot. And yeah. I felt that pain. I was like, what the fuck? <sighs> like that, the next morning, I went to the, the city MD. They were like, oh, yeah, you got a hernia. You need surgery. Mm. I was like, fuck. Uh, how long does it take? They're like, probably takes like a day for a half a day for the surgery or n- not even like an hour for the surgery. Yeah. And then like a week or so of recovery. I was like, okay. That's it? Week? Yeah, it's just like, they stitch you. I mean, it's like you can walk and all that kind of shit after. It's still like the scar takes a very long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Did you get the mesh put in? Yeah, the mesh put in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I I remember before the Oscars, like, how am I going to get in shape again? How do I got to stay in shape? I got like two weeks and like, I asked the doctor. (laughs) (laughs) This is so funny. This is the last thing that matters for the fucking Oscars. Yeah, but I wanted to fucking, I want to be cool, man. And I asked the doctor if I could swim. And he's like, yeah, you can swim. Just like, don't do anything crazy. And uh, so I would, the hotel that they put us up at had a, a beautiful pool. So I would just go swim and like, try to make sure that the, the bandage like didn't show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want anyone to see like, oh, this man is swimming with a <laughs> fucking giant, like forty stitches in his <laughs> on his abdomen right now. And I was just like, you know, doggy paddle, try to do shit. It didn't really work. I mean, I didn't win any awards at the Oscars for most fit. Did you walk? Did Chris go like, Nimesh, you look <laughs> no, great right now. <laughs> no, no, did you? This joke's trash, but <laughs> goddamn, you're looking good. Are you on opioids right now? <laughs> I am. I am, Chris. I am on opioids. Did you get any? particular jokes into the Oscars that year? No, I I had one or two that got cut from dress or air, I think. Uh, and it was like, uh, I pitched a joke to Chris the night or two prior when we were talking about acting. He, so he we wrote the set, he wrote the set, all of us together, and uh, he was running it at the store and a bunch of clubs in, yeah. in LA. And I think a night or two prior uh, to the show, he was, this is He's talking about the Oscars being, or excuse me, actors being brave. Mm. So brave is not acting is not brave. I pitched. Uh, brave is drinking a glass of water in Flint, Michigan. This is when Flint was popping off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it <laughs> wasn't now. It was like an old day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, he punched it up to say on stage. He said, "Brave is drinking a glass of Kool Aid in Flint, Michigan," and like that mm-hmm. crushed. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'm not sure if it made it to air. I don't think it did. It might have been cut. Yeah. Or he might have just cut it on the fly kind of thing. Sure. But uh, that was like the one thing. I remember him laughing at it and it crushing in the when we did it at the store and stuff. I was yeah, like, okay, yeah, that's, yeah. that's enough. Sure. Uh, for me, it would have been great to have jokes on like in the actual monologue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I did get a sketch on. I think the Suge Knight uh, thing that we did was uh, uh, my pitch, I think. Mm-hmm. But yeah. It was it was a fun experience. Working out had nothing to do with it. I didn't sure. need, I didn't need to have a hernia to uh, to go to the Oscars, but I did get a lot of drugs out of it, and uh, I got a, I got a bid out of it. So thank you, uh, Chris Rock, once again. Sure. <laughs> so so you had that, and you go, okay, that's what bald pain is. Yes, it's that's a hernia. What we're talking about. I thought I I thought I had a hernia, and uh, you know, the arrogant old me is like, yeah, I could wait, I could ride this out, you know. Yeah. Plus, I had a bunch of dates coming up, and uh, and honestly, I was like really like you know what it is like you you record a special, you don't want to do any of that shit again. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just come off tour in February, and I just recorded my special in December. Thank you, China, that special. And I was like, I got two weeks off, and uh, I got nothing, no jokes that I want to do. The fuck am I going to talk about? Uh, same night, my birthday night, my balls hurt, and I go to the, and I was like, 
something in the back of my head was like, this is not right. There's something, if it, I want to know if it's a hernia, then I can wait. How would you describe the pain? Because they always ask, like I had a ball pain mm -hmm. recently and it was like hollow was the best I could come up with. Mm -hmm. And they said it was just, they said it was my hamstring, mm -hmm. something fucked up. They put, they numbed it and it was fine. Uh -huh. But, but how it, would you have described it? It's a, so hard. A hernia pain is a sharp pain, Uh huh. right? You've had a hernia before. It's like, if you don't recall, it's a sharp pain in your balls and you're like, what the fuck? It's like, it hurts. This was like a dull, like someone's like flicking my ball. Mm. And it was like a dull pain that just wouldn't go and linger. Yeah. Hernia pain like is sharp and sharp. then it'll stop. This is like a dull pain that lingered for a little while and like lingered for too long. And I was I was peeing. And I was like, it's three it literally is like three o'clock in the morning when I got back from uh drinking with my sister and wife and, and Che and a bunch of people. And uh I was like, this this isn't right. And I'm drunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, this is doubly wrong because if you're drunk, you usually don't feel shit. Like I walked home on a sprained ankle. Sure. Drunk. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I'm fucking fine, man. It's nothing. But like I'm drunk and I feel pain. Like I gotta I should go to the hospital. Yeah. Because if it is a hernia pain, which is what I think it is, I'll just wait. I can I can eat the hernia pain. I'll just wait to Sure. But if it's like epididymitis or torsion. Yeah, because that's what I heard when I was in high school. There was a rumor: if you, if you fuck someone too hard from behind, you might tear your ball. And they got to take it off. Yes, I thought I would. That's a. Like, and meanwhile, I'm fucking nobody at the time, and I was like, oh, <laughs> this is so stressful. I don't even know. What to that's, do. that's why I don't fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to get torsion, <laughs> but it was, it was like that was part of my concern. I was like, do I have torsion? Is it, I'm like my. Uh, a what like am I in the midst of getting like a really bad case of torsion or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And let me just go. And that requires you to have surgery. You, yeah. That otherwise you lose the ball. They have sure. to like go in there and untwist it or some shit. Like, let me go to the hospital. Call a car to the hospital. Get it to the hospital. They do an ultrasound, and I'm like, all right, it's not torsion. Or what, I hope it's not torsion. If it's torsion, hopefully they got to go and just fix it real quick. Yeah. Come back. It's not torsion. You have a mass. Uh, on your right testicle and uh, I was like alright the fuck does that mean they're like we don't know we don't know what it is uh, it doesn't look like anything and uh, uh, they're like okay then they sketch like th this is what bothered me a lot and it didn't hit me as to uh, how fucked up it was until I talked to my urologist like when I was shooting the special yeah I was at NYU the ER where I went to get my ultrasound <laughs> They see it's a mess. The next day, they tell me to call NYU to schedule follow-up. Mm -hmm. And they say it's going to take two months to see a doctor. I'm like, two months? You tell me I got a mass on my nut? I got to wait two months? To yeah. see if I'm not Canadian, bro. I got insurance. I'm going to fucking, I'm going to go to see a doctor immediately. Of course. And they're like, no, it's a standard protocol. You just wait two months. We'll see, you know, if the mass has grown, then uh, we'll go in there and cut. If not, you know, it's nothing to go worry about. And my urologist is like, you know why they do that? And I was like, I thought it was just so that they could wait. And like, they were trying to make NYU trying to make me see NYU so they could keep the money in the family kind of thing. Sure. The doctor gave me even more sinister take. He's like, you know why they do that, right? I was like, why? He's like, because there's more money in giving you chemo. No, really? I was like, that's fucking sinister, bro. That is fucking. No, that can't be true. Isn't that crazy? That's horrifying. That's horrifying. It's like, yeah, all right. Well, if it metastasizes, you have a life lifelong patient or a patient that's going to be with you for six months to a year versus you go in, snip it out. That's you're done. That'd be like if NYU like had like a, like a funeral home service attached. And they'd be like, Vertical we'll check it on in five years, <laughs> yep. five years, because we make a lot more. A, a, a big bigger profit off the casket. There's no money in the cure. The money's in the medicine. Mm -hmm, I learned that mm -hmm. from Chris Rock. Chris Rock. Blacker, you know, but it's like, it holds true. And I was like, that bothered me so much. Luckily I learned it, you know, like, uh, like a month ago, like that. I didn't even consider that sinister ass angle about the whole thing. That's one of those things where I hear it and I go, Ooh, that's dark. Yeah. And I can't tell whether it's an overly cynical view or if it's true. I can't tell. To me, I think the world's so unorganized that it is just they don't have time and they're overbooked. And things are never 
there's no one smart enough to make it as sinister as as your imagination might make you think. I, I appreciate your optimism, but I think uh, <laughs> it's a very sad optimism. It's not that optimistic. But I think uh, help, I think people are more stupid than they are evil. I think is my my hypothesis. I, I, it's a beautiful hypothesis, but I think uh, I don't think you could be smart enough to become a urologist, but also be so stupid as to think that yeah, like oh, I can't organize my schedule such that you know we'll see people immediately, <laughs> like that, like that, that. There's no way. Sure. And I think people who are smart enough to it's again just goes back to the bottom line. Every insurance company, every healthcare company is you're a number to them, mm -hmm. right? It's like oh, what are the odds? What what's the maximum revenue we can generate from you as a patient? Yeah, yeah. That you won't die. Let's do that. You sure. know, it's ne it's very rarely about the quality of this person's existence or uh, uh, the general well-being. It's just, OK, how do we milk as much money from you as possible? And whether that, that's how your premiums are based, that's how all your care is dictated. So for them to be like two months, hopefully it doesn't spread. If it does, we got you. You know, it's like that that I can see happening, you know. So next day. So the next day you go, fuck that. I'm finding my own person. I got six doctor cousins, eight actually, and uh, call one of them. You know, that's that's the beautiful thing about America. If you got insurance and Indian cousins, you will be fine. Uh huh. Uh, uh, I just called one of them. They're like, oh yeah, well, I'll connect you to my urologist friend. The urologist calls me like a few hours later. He's he sees the ultrasound. He's like, it's a benign cyst, but I'm gonna order some blood work. Because like the the cancer, like the mass itself had no vascularity. Yeah. And that's like the prime, one of the prime indicators for it being a tumor versus it being a cancerous tumor versus it being like a benign cyst. And he said, he asked me what kind of pain I felt. And I told him it was pain. And he's like, that's, that's very not like cancer because cancer does, testicular cancer doesn't present as pain. Mm -hmm. It presents as like the, the feeling you feel is a, is a weight. Yeah. Like you feel like, like it has to get, it, it's a mass. So it's definitely just a weight in your balls. As sure. It's like a pain in your balls. Like, so what was the pain doc? He's like, probably some inflammation, in your epididymis, you know, mm -hmm. very common. Sure. Uh, take medicine. It's going to go away. I was like, okay, cool. And like that night, it was the a day after my birthday. I was like, man, I'm chilling. I was, it was a scare, but I'm good. Next day at nine o'clock in the morning, I go get the blood work. And, uh, <laughs> it was like just like such a surreal experience because this lady was like super nice Eastern European lady. And like it was I cut this part from the special, but uh, uh, I was doing it for a second on stage. It was just like she like I made a I'm, I hate needles. I told yeah. her, I relayed that to her. How and bad? Like, are you like, are, you, are they like, you need to sit still? No, 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 none of that. You just, like, you're looking I, away. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I hit an age, I hated him too, and I used to squirm. Yeah, yeah. And I hit an age and a height where the nurse was like, we can't force this on you. You're six foot four. Yeah. So either let us do it or we can't do it. Right. You know, I can't just be like, no. <laughs> Stop. Well, give me a lollipop. No, it wasn't nothing like that. It was just, I just made a very tense fist and, uh, she like was about to put the needle and she dropped it. Oh, and she's like, I'm so sorry. You know, uh, you know, I thought you were going to hit me. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> you thought I was going to hit you? And she's like, yeah, some guys, you know, the toughest guys, they come in and then like, it's just a knee jerk reaction. They just fucking swing. At, I was like, no lady, you're too Eastern European. Like this, that's not happening. Oh my God. I'm not doing that. I the promise you. That you just punched this nurse. It's <laughs> like a reaction. Like, no, that's not happening lady. I'll be fine. Don't worry. Then I, I just was like, I gripped both things. Get the blood work. And they ordered like a bunch of panels. Normally it's like one or two, but mm -hmm. I guess the cancer panels, like a few. And then he rushed the results. And the next day, like 745 in the morning, my phone's ringing. And I'm like, why am I getting a phone call from my doctor at 745? Yeah. I hope it's normally like <laughs> good news. You can wait. Sure. Monday. Sure. Bad news is you want to learn immediately. Right? Hey, I just want you to have a really good morning. Yeah. Let you know, everything's good. I'm hung over, you know, I'm just like, oh, fire. what's up, man? It's like, uh, listen, I was wrong. It's not assist. Your blood work indicates you got cancer. Uh, you have to have surgery. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you this, but good news is you caught it very early. Like, like emotionally, where are you at? What kind of person are you freaking out? You no, no, like no registration of, uh, what is happening at all. It's just like problems. My brain goes problem solve. 
Uh-huh. Okay, cancer, what am I supposed to do? Surgery? Okay, when do we schedule? Tuesday? Okay, cool. Can they still go on the road? No, you should probably. Can they wait? No? Okay. Because right, I got road dates. Okay. <laughs> when do I tell my folks? No, you can tell them now. Uh, this is what it is. Is there any chance it's not that? No. This is like your panels are this, 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 and this. And then they I, knew right away it was just one ball. No, they knew right away because the other one didn't have anything. Didn't have it. Okay, cool. Yeah, and they were like, it's very early. Like it's probably yeah, like yeah. weeks old, you know? Damn. That, and because it was like my, the size of the mass was on its own, very small, no vascularity. But on top of that, the hormone indicator, the, the HCG, it's like the, I forget what it stands for, but it's like the main, one of the indicators that indicates you have cancers, the stuff yeah. that likes placenta grow. It's like germ cell, uh, uh, tumor. The hormone indicator was at 35 micro units per liter or something. Sure. People with like cancer, cancer are at like thousands. Yeah. Mine was literally 35. Would it be called stage one or even before like that? Stage zero one TA, like the best kind of testicular cancer you could have. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I had. Yeah. And uh, uh, the doctor was like, yeah, regardless, you got to get it cut out like immediately because you don't want it to spread. You don't want it to break off and go to a lymph node, that kind of thing. I was like, all right. And uh, then I then I did go into denial for like loosely, like because like, I, I was bargaining. I don't know what the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew my death, my ball was going to die. <laughs> so I was like, all right, I've gone through all those stages of grief kind of. Were you like, I couldn't pick my balls out of a lineup. Were you like holding it? No. You're looking at it like, I guess you're yeah, going man. away. You got to go, bro. It's, it's all right, man. Were you Googling like, how will this affect boners? I, I, my first thought was. Right. That's, that's your first question immediately. I thought prosthetic. Did you get a prosthetic? I did get a prosthetic. Uh, they put a fake, and this is, uh, it, it might be like my memory or the doctor didn't tell me that he was going to put a fake one in. You know, I kind of just woke up and I was like, what the fuck is this shit? Like, <laughs> you put it, why is my, I thought it was going to look a lot different than it did. I thought it was going to be like, like a deflated balloon kind of thing. Sure. But it was like just a regular old ball sack. And I was like, he's like, yeah, I got you. you know, did like, it look the same? Was it more even? It was looks, it? It looks ex like nothing ever happened. But it's your, it's because it's your skin. Yes. It's your testicle. It's my, it's my it's scrotum. Scrotum. And they go in like right above. It's kind of hard to point out here, but they go in right above. You watch the video, guys. Namesh is now on the table. He's <laughs> <showing> yeah. <laughs> uh, put your pants. Put your pants back on. There's a degree when women get when women get fake tits. Sometimes with their friends, they're like, "Feel them, feel them." I feel like with guys be like, "You want to feel the fake, the yeah, fake ball? Touch the ball, man." <laughs> is it? What is it made out of? Silicone. So it's got a squish to it. It's got it's it's kind of like a lychee candy. Have you ever had one of those? <laughs> it's like firm and soft at the same time. It's very nice. It's uh it's a uh, it's a lot more confidence inspiring than the left one, the the fake than the real one. You and could you you could feel the difference between the 100%, 100%. two. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, you and could, you the could fake squeeze a the right bit. one. You could like it like the left one like the fa the real one like it still has some sensitivity to it. You know, like you, it could hurt. Yeah, if you squeeze yeah. It too hard. The right one, I. There's a stress ball. Like I, I could, I could go to town, dude. Oh my god, that's your new stress ball. <laughs> but yeah, so like when the doctor told me, when I woke up and I was like, "What the fuck is this?" He's like, yeah, "I got you hooked up." And they put a fake one in because, like, psychologically, men need to. Like they did. I do this in the special, so I don't want to shit on too much, but or step on it too much. But it's like it, I didn't know this, but it's like psychologically, men need two balls. When, when they have one, they a guy go with crazy. One, a guy with one, a guy versus a guy with two, like. They've done studies and people with the guy with one like always feels less masculine, less like a man subconsciously even. Really? And like it drills away at you like oh, I only got one ball. Whereas the guy with two still feels complete. I wonder if I'd feel the stress of it. I feel like one's better. It's more convenient. Yeah, I don't know. I, I You know, what I started Googling was beyond like first my first Google was. <laughs> what was the first? It must have been a horrifying <laughs> list of Google searches. The first was like the the first, literally the first one was, what else could make this hormone go up? Because you're gonna you're gonna re-diagnose it. Yeah, I was like, what what else could cause this? And that's the bargaining stage. Yes, yes. I'm, like, I, and I read this thing that says like. Uh, uh, like on nothightimes.com. You know, it's just some like obscure site that says like weed can make it 
might elevate this hormone level falsely. I was like, do I have a false positive here? Cause I, I had smoked that, that Friday night when I got told I had a mass. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like when, and I had talked after I talked to the urologist and he told me it was fine. Like I was like celebrating. I fucking took a bong to the face. Like I was, I love the doctor being like, he's like, okay, so it's either cancer uh-huh. or you high as fuck. brother. <laughs> yeah. yeah smoking. Huh? Let me ask you, do you have the munchies? <laughs> You're good, bro. You're good, man. No. Go eat a cupcake. You'll be fine. And I called it. And I was like, doc, I called him. He was like, Hey man, like, uh, <laughs> Listen. I love all these doctors getting these phone calls being like, no, it's, was it not hightimes.com? No, no, it's not. He's like, uh, you match that that's uh false. Uh, there's no way your, your weed smoking is causing you to have a falsely elevated HCG level. Okay. You idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Stop trying to not have surgery. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I was like, okay, fine. And then my mom, my mom was more concerned about my jizz than I was in the sense of like, can you still have kids? Like what freeze your sperm and all this kind of shit. And, uh, the doctor, I asked the doctor, can I, f- do I freeze it? He's like, no, you don't freeze before because, uh, you don't want any sperm coming from that defective ball anyway. Really? You know, because that's the, that sperm coming from that ball is tainted with cancerous cells somehow potentially. What would the kid come out like would the kid come out with who knows <laughs> sure <laughs> it's just a right-wing lunatic you know <laughs> uh and so i was like okay and then my mom was like make sure you know, just i'm concerned just check yeah. so she wasn't she, your mom wasn't like can you still fuck no she no, was no. just like can you fuck that one time yes give me one exactly grandkid? can you have kids like how does it what is it how does it impact everything and i was like and she's like just make sure that you're doing the right thing here and then i read this other thing um, that says that the back of the envelope test for testicular cancer is to get a pregnancy test because the indicator, the hormone that, that the pregnancy test reads is the same hormone that's present in, uh, people with testicular cancer. Interesting. So I went to the bodega and all my cousins were like, no, you have cancer. <laughs> 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 no, you dumbass. <laughs> like, yeah, sure. Go get the fucking first response from the bodega. It's going to tell you the I, same. You should post a picture of that positive test. Like, I wish. Hey, I, good news. I, cancer. I, I wish I had it. I wish it's like a, it's a fucking little like COVID test size. Yeah. <laughs> thing and um <laughs> i saw some some tweet it was someone sent their friend a positive COVID test and they're like congrats <laughs> they're like no you fucking idiot oh, no, it's fucking COVID. yeah i took the test you piss in a cup dip the the stick in and it comes back and it's like super faint but yeah, it, yeah, it yeah. was still like positive i was like okay <laughs> i guess i have a baby now you know and it was it was that and then the next day uh the net the, the it was like three days of just like talking, figuring out what I was supposed to do the day before surgery was like, I went on a, I was at Jersey city medical center for like five hours Mm -hmm. doing like the pre surgery check-in paperwork bullshit. And like, I gotta get blood work. I gotta, they gotta test me for COVID. They gotta uh, make sure I can pay for it. I gotta like give them like a thousand bucks deposit, uh, at like seven, eight o'clock in the morning, mind you. Do all that after like four hours, five hours, I get back to my apartment in Brooklyn. And then the doctor's office calls me and is like, Oh, you went all the way to Jersey City? You could have you could have done that like two blocks from your house. Mm. I'm like, bro, I just ate like five hours out of my day and I'm like shitting like if I I have the tweets that I was tweeting up from that that day last year. Yeah like at the hospital, like just going off on American healthcare. Like this is a criminal enterprise. Like everyone just sitting here, just wait. Like there's nurses are understaffed. No one here is being paid. I'm more likely to get COVID here. Why am I going? Why do I got to go this far to get a COVID test? It's only because they can maximize the money here. They got some sure. deal going on with the COVID test. I was just like, like I know enough about healthcare. Are you dropping the chemo thing? I also heard this. Yes. Get no, this shit. I, if I didn't know that, at the, if I knew that at the time, I would have just walked away from the whole thing. But it was just like I was fucking livid. Like just like and 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 I'm very privileged. Of course, I have very good insurance, and I'm connected to d- enough doctors where I'm getting surgery three days after diagnosis, which is like insane. 
Yeah, it's not emergency surgery. This and is- I'm connected. I mean, I'm connected through the the Jewish doctors. Are like, yeah, someone knows someone who even if it, maybe I can't get an appointment right away, but like I can be like, hey, do I need to freak out about this right now? Right. And they can give me that peace of mind, which is worth all the money in yes. the world for me. And, and and I'm still sitting there livid. I can't imagine what those, some of the people around me are going through because not everyone has what I have. Not everyone yeah. has like this hyper connection. Not everyone has like the best insurance on the planet. And so I was fucking heated and I'm talking shit about doctors. I'm talking shit about hospitals, insurance companies. And then I got doctors coming at me like, you don't know shit about healthcare or word. I don't know shit about healthcare. Let me talk to my six doctor cousins. And and then we can have a conversation about, I don't know shit about healthcare just because I'm Were not. Were doctors a, defending the system? They must all be frustrated too. Some doctors defend the system. Some doctors don't like that the blame is upon income uh, is on them. And sure. I, I get that, you know, uh, but I also understand that a lot of doctors are part of the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if you take it personally, uh, I get it. But also, you know, I always try to, I, I wanted to be a doctor when I was in high school. And yeah. part of college. Do you know what kind of doctor you want to be or just you want to be in the profession? I wanted at, very early on. I wanted to be a, a cardiothoracic surgeon. Damn. Like, I just a pediatric cardiothoracic surgeon when I was a kid because I had a family member or a family friend who was a child that had a hole in his heart. And I was like, that's so cool that you, that people fix this and, you know, like save lives and shit. Sure. And I just thought it was like a very noble. Of course, profession. it is a noble profession. It is. And, uh, uh, you know, I got a C plus in Orgo my junior year and was very quickly dissuaded. <laughs> uh, uh, you're going to kill more kids than you're going to yeah, save. As I, I, this. And my heart was literally not in it. You know, I, was like, I don't want to do this shit at all. It's like, <laughs> I was a quitter. I quit. Sure. And so uh, in like, when I, when I come at doctors, it's not just from a, a consumer standpoint. It's from a standpoint of, I know I like to believe that if I were a physician, on top of saving lives, I'll be fighting the man. Mm. I'm fucked this system. Like all these MBAs are coming in. They don't know shit about healthcare. Just trying to maximize the revenue of this hospital and this per square, per bed kind of bullshit. That's what's going on. Yeah. And that is part of the problem. Of course. Uh, but in that hospital room that morning, I'm sitting there like, fuck all this. Meanwhile, I'm benefiting from the hyper capitalism in the system. You know, like I'm, I'm seeing a doctor literally two business days after my balls hurt. Well, I think that's what reinforces it is that the rich people also get really good, really good doctors. Yeah. You know, my doctor was incredible. Part of, part of like, you know, making it universal is everyone gets the same mm-hmm. and that's just counter to yep. people in power's interests. Yes. And it's like, Oh, well, I got to be here with the poor. So, you know, like- yeah, yeah. My doctor better have gone to and Hopkins. like and like people might have might try to have moral views, but when it comes to them dying potentially, mm-hmm. you're going to see the worst of everybody. Yep, that's what it is. Uh, in terms of losing a ball, mm-hmm. do how does it affect performance? You don't have to tell me your performance, but what did what did you Google when you when it, does it say like half as much? It doesn't. Or does one ball make up for it? It just starts overdrive. It, that's that's what it is. The, yeah. The doctor told me is like, no, this is the human body is like this miraculous thing people barely understand. Sure. Where it's like the body knows if if one thing is gone, like it'll over time produce the same amount. It'll make up the slack for what the the missing ball is doing. And I was yeah. Like, that's awesome. And then, luckily for me on the road, like. I've done, you know, a billion shows at this point talking about this shit. And so like at a lot of shows, people will be like, man, I had cancer. I got one ball. I got three kids. I'm like, oh, you're good, man. I'm like, thank you. Thank you for that vote of confidence. I don't want three. That's a lot. But yeah, I'm, I'm glad your shit still worked afterwards. You know, and like that, that's always been like uh, heartwarming to hear in like a very funny way. Hey, man, I lost a nut. I got three little... Rugrats running around. Wish I lost them both. You know, that kind of shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) All right, cool, man. That's that makes me feel good that like it's still uh, all good down there. Do you have any paranoia? Because my whole thing is if I lost one ball, I'd just be thinking about the other one. Oh, yeah. That that is a hard thing to uh, not think about. 
uh, but I, I have managed to not think about it because that's not in my control. If I if I lose if I lose the other one, I'm going full trance for sure. I'm getting titties. <laughs> <Whoa. laughs> we, we, that dick will be a clit real fast, the biggest clit in the world. I mean, it's out there. We'll see how the medical system deals with that one. Oh, they'll figure it out. They'll be like, they actually didn't need to take your balls. It's just they make more money off the trans surgery than yeah. they do off the nut surgery. You're right, and that's how you do it. Um, well, I'm glad. I'm glad you're okay. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm glad I'm okay too. I uh, fuck man. I just I like the idea of a lot of guys coming up to you now being like, I got one ball too. You would be. We got a one ball brotherhood. You, it's that's what, who I'm banking on watching this special. I feel like uh, a lot of people who are friends with people who had testicular cancer or torsion or whatever will be, hey, bro. This guy, you guys should start a club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> two balls, one dude. You know, like uh, that, kind of, that kind of shit. It's just like uh, two balls, two dudes, whatever the fuck. But it's been consistent. Uh, when I do shows where I meet people afterwards, yeah, people will be like, "Hey, man, just wanted to let you know, man. Thank that. I appreciate. It. I went through the same thing." Yeah. Can we get a picture? <laughs> like, Can you picture? Cr- you get your ball out. I get yeah, my ball yeah, out. Yeah. Let's do it together. Um, my favorite was in, uh, I was in Adanya Beach Improv in Florida. Yeah. And uh, normally I'll just like pick like one or two people out of the crowd. They're just like, and, and I don't want to reveal too much sauce, but uh, sorry to uh, break the fourth wall. But it's like, I will talk to like one or two people in the crowd to make it feel like I'm having a conversation. Of course. So that, you know, the rest of the crowd is jealous and they want to have a conversation mm-hmm. too and, and pay attention more. And I was just taught one guy and I'll usually find, find someone who has never heard of me or, or, or yeah. seen my shit before and end up talking to one dude in the crowd and like relaying the story effectively to him and everyone else, like through, through him, he came up after me. He's like, how the, how, how did you know? I was like, know what? He's like, Last year, I went through the same shit, bro. I was like, that's crazy. The the balls aligned on that one, you know? Like, God was like, these two nuts need to be together. And I was like, that that made me feel so good. Because if, even if I didn't make him laugh, I had yeah. helped him process some shit. Because when you have testicular cancer, like, you think about it every now and then. You know? like, It'd be oh. amazing if you could start sensing it. You know, a deep, you yeah. can see a man, you're like, one ball? Mm-hmm. You, How do- how'd you know you, you it's I can it's see brother it's yeah no it's always the most brolic dude yeah because like part part of the thing once they that, lose a the ball they're like i'm gonna get uh, yeah get fucking jacked get fucking rib bro I'm, I'm still a man <laughs> you know and it's like that <laughs> that's why you're at the gym the that, other day that's why i saw I'm you're at the like gym. Mm-hmm. i'm reaffirming my manhood it's like yeah i'm fucking benching bro fuck a hernia but like it was it was that that is definitely something that happens yeah uh to a lot of dudes so that's i think that's the sense i'm gonna pick up on like me you don't look like an athlete. Mm-hmm. You got one ball. <laughs> How the fuck? Yeah, I can sense it, bro. Um, well, as we wrap this up, I like we do. Uh, uh, you better count your blessings. Something you're thankful for, other than the doctors. I know you're very thankful for <laughs> your cousin. Did you ever see the ball? Did you get to look at it? No, I wish, man. They, I tried to. I wanted to keep it. You know, turn it into NFT they must they, have, they must have to put it in like a special bag or something. They, there's no way they're like chucking it. No, no like Kobe. It's, it's not a yo-yo or anything. No, they. Uh, uh, oh, I don't. I don't know if I want to see it. I would. I would want to see it. Ah! I would want. I wanted to see it, but they like they send it off to pathology almost immediately to confirm that it was cancer. So they it's sliced. Would they up. tell you if it wasn't? Yeah. Hey, our bad. Uh, yeah, it was weed. Yeah, it was weed. Oh my god, we should have listened to you, dude. Looks like something. You should have stuck in medical school. You are a genius. Something was just stuck on your ball, man. <laughs> but it was. They know, like, no, you got cancer. I was like, okay, cool. Uh, what am I grateful for? It can be super. super I'll, I'll tell you one. It's. It's. I. I. Uh, a lot of hotels. I sometimes feel like. Sometimes I feel like a lot of the roles that like a concierge played like went away. Mm-hmm. So like if you ask them like what's a good restaurant, they're it's, they have no idea. And so I really appreciate when someone's like really personal mm-hmm. or feels like they're in the know. And uh, I had an early flight. I was booking a four thirty a.m. taxi, uh-huh. and I called this company. And after I hung up, she was like, "Don't go with that company. Uh-huh. They don't show up." Oh, I've shit. seen a lot of people freak out because they don't show up. And I'm like, thank you so much. Oh, at the at the at the hotel. It, it was a different hotel. Oh, okay. But it was just like 
anyone at the front desk who is going that extra step beyond I feel like there was a time when hotels, they'd like, you know where to go. And, and now it's like, you do it all on your phone. So there's nothing. There's, you don't get the feeling of like, welcome to the hotel. Yeah. And so when someone makes you feel that, uh-huh. you f- it's, a nice, it's a nice feeling. That's a, that's a good thing to be grateful for. I'm, I'm, yesterday, I was very grateful. For, I'm, I'm grateful all the time. Mm-hmm. It's very hard to be. It's a very hard emotion to constantly have in your head. Of course. Of gratitude. But yes, I'm, I'm grateful for it. Now, in the moment, I was just like, thank you. But uh, yes, I went to the, the market at the hotel. Yeah. And I got a croissant and I, it was seven bucks. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I wanted a croissant and I, and I just got it. Yeah. And I was like, seven dollars for a croissant. And the, the guy behind the counter was like, yeah, it's, it's like the airport here, man. I'm sorry. And I was like, just like that guy acknowledging. Yeah. That we live in a fucking crazy world where a croissant like that's like this big is seven dollars. Like that felt like a human moment. Yeah, it is nice. It's like, yeah, man, what the fuck? <laughs> Charge me less. But I know he's not his croissant. Of course. <laughs> but, but. Me, that's when I was in Vegas. When I did the the cellar in Vegas. It was a feeling where everything was that. Yeah. Every hotel, Starbucks coffee, nine dollars. And it just felt like fuck you and it's not their fault no. so it's nice to get a little like you're right man yeah you're right this is fucking dumb this yeah should, this is a, a doll the croissant is two dollars i wish i was seeing any of the margin that they're making you know <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah man sorry i'm like i know i appreciate you acknowledging the fucking bananas ass world we live was in, it right? good no <laughs> All right. Great market in Austin. <laughs> God damn it. Seven dollars for that croissant. Like for what? It's not flaky. It's not buttery. God damn. It should this that was like a two dollar croissant for sure. Mm-hmm. Like it was not a, it was not seven bucks. I could I paid seven dollars for a croissant before. I'm like, man, this is a fire ass croissant. This is fucking perfect. No, it feels really not. powerful when they tell you before sunset. I'm like, how much is the coffee? And they'll be like nine dollars. I'll be like, that's okay. Yeah. I'm gonna go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That nine, feels good. Nine bucks. Yeah, I'm I'm too much of a, a pussy ass consumer. Yeah, like inflation is like, uh, yeah, all right. Not, what am I not gonna have coffee? So uh, uh, as I said, this episode is coming out on May 9th. Other than Fox News, where can people find you? <laughs> uh, the special will be on YouTube as of now. It's called Lucky Lefty or I Lost My Right Nut and I, all I got was a stupid special. That's the full title. Um, you can find me on Instagram, TikTok, all that shit. Finding Nimesh. Hell yeah. I, uh, I'm going to be at, uh, Cleveland, Ohio hilarities, May 26th, May 27th, and then helium, Indianapolis, June 2nd, June 3rd. Fantastic rooms. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm excited. And then the big ones, guys, I'll be in, uh, uh, Los Angeles headlining the Hollywood improv September 25th. And in London, London, if you're listening, November 3rd, uh, November 2nd sold out. So come to that, join the Patreon, patreon.com slash downside. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Say say something sad, something uh, uh, shitty, and let's let's get out of here. (laughs) Robots are taking over, everybody. Robots are taking over, and uh, this has been ChatGPT signing off. This is the downside. Listening to the downside. The downside with John Marco Cerezi.